there is a great deal of importance on timing. Timing is very important. We have a passage this morning found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, that talks about the fullness of time. The Bible says in Galatians 4, 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do our best today to, to get a better grasp of the concept of time and timing. And Lord, to understand that you are the master of all time, the creator of it and the master of it, so that we may be in better understanding of why things happen when they happen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This term, the fullness of time, was come. It's implied that someone knows when that is. Now, if you are like me, I find that I sometimes have a timetable or I have an expectation of when something should happen, and yet the Lord has a different concept of it. Have you noticed that? Uh, there are things that I want now, but God says later. There are things that I would rather see later, and God says, no, you're going to see that now. That We have a different concept of time. Why was it that Jesus came exactly on that day that he came? Why was he born in Bethlehem on that day? Why did he die when he was crucified on that day? What, what is the determinant? And of course, we understand that it, it has to be God. It can't be a human being because you would have varying opinions. There has to be an ultimate intellect, an ultimate being who decides what is the fullness of time. Uh, I look through the Bible and I see many examples of how God uh, was in control of time and he told his prophets that this was going to happen and, uh, at a certain time and why. Uh, we have in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, another interesting passage about time. It, it says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, there's several places in this short passage here that mentions time and the concept of time. These last days, time past, sundry times. God is in control of this thing that we know as time. Now, the exact timing of the work of Christ's redemption was set by God before the world began. The Bible says that he was slain before the foundation of the world. All the particulars, all the, the circumstances... All the events surrounding that preceded and were contemporary with the coming of Jesus were orchestrated by God himself. And we must understand that the, the Father uh, planned it from eternity past. So let's understand point number one. First of all, God set the time. It was God who set the time for this wonderful event that Jesus would come, that he would die for our sins, and that we would be made his children, and that God would then be our father. And so he set the time, and he set it before the foundation of the world. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now what the Bible is saying here is that when Jesus came and when Jesus died for our sins, that was the plan of God from the beginning. That was something that God foresaw and foretold and pre-planned before time even began. God had this uh, planned out. And so it is important that we understand that Jesus' coming and Jesus' death on the cross was something before the foundation of the world. Now, not only that, but it was foretold in advance. Uh, God, all throughout His Word, through His prophets and through Scriptures, foretold of this great event. 
Uh, we are told, for example, in Daniel chapter 9, which uh, if you have never made a study of that uh, concept, which is called Daniel's 70 weeks of prophecy, it is a timeline for prophecy. These are 70 weeks of years, that is 70 uh, periods of seven years each, in which certain things are said to happen, and they do happen exactly as God said. And if you make a study of that, and if you get a timeline of earth's history and lay it side by side with that prophecy, you can mark off the things that are prophesied until you come up to the exact day in which Jesus was crucified. And the Bible says that he uh, died, and the Bible says that he died, but not for himself. That is, he died a sacrificial death. Uh, and so the time that he would die was foretold. Also, how he would die was foretold. Now, nowhere in the Old Testament does it say that Jesus will die by crucifixion. That word was not even uh, employed in the Old Testament. But we do have two passages of, of Scripture. One is Psalm 22, and the other one is Isaiah 53. And in those two Psalms, we have a picture of the crucifixion. We find that they pierced his hands and his feet. We find that his bones were out of joint. Uh, we find the fact that he was lifted up. Uh, we have uh, all of these expressions about how his heart melted in the midst of his chest. All of these expressions uh, talk about uh, the agony that one would have in crucifixion. And so this was told at a time when crucifixion was not even uh, invented yet as a means of putting someone to death. So it is foretold the time he would die, and it is foretold how he would die. And this foretold hundreds and hundreds of years before he actually died. So this was the plan from the start. Now we know that God is the one who uh, came up with the plan of redemption. God is the one who implemented the plan of redemption. And that God is the one who himself came down as Jesus Christ and performed the plan of redemption himself being the sacrifice. Now I submit to you that that is love. If there ever was love or ever will be love, that's love. Because God had a plan that involved saving you. God had a plan that involved saving you at his great expense. God had a plan that involved saving you while he suffered uh, that you were exempted from suffering. And we ought to be thankful for what God has done for us. We ought to be grateful and serve him and worship his holy name. So God uh, made the time. Also, uh, number two, God kept the time. Now, it's one thing to plan something. It's another thing to carry it out. You know, I am totally 100% capable right now of planning, planning now to run the Boston Marathon. I can plan it. I can, I can get my t-shirt. I can have a number. I could enter the race. I could even make a start. But am I going to perform it? No, about a half a mile down the road, I'm done. And the rest are going to continue to run. That is if I make the half mile. So I could plan to climb, uh, you know, Denali if I wanted to. I could plan. I could get at the foot of the mountain. I could look up. I could have all the gear. I could have all the need I want. And so I'm planning to climb the mountain. <laughs> I have high hopes. Well, a certain way up, I'm going to change my mind and come right back down if I'm able to make it down. Why? Because performing something is much harder than planning something. Now, God not only planned it, he performed it. He employed, first of all, his holy angels. You think about all the people that angels appeared to. Angels appeared to Zacharias, appeared to Mary, appeared to Joseph, appeared to the shepherds. And they also came and attended Christ during his temptation. Angels were very involved uh, in the appearance of Jesus Christ. And so God employed the heavenly angels. They had a job to do. Now, I've always thought about the angels, and I don't know how they think. Uh, you know, I've, I've never met one. Uh, uh, but I, I do believe that they are holy, that they are sinless, that they are divine creatures, uh, and that they are spirits. And the Bible says they watch after you and me. But I, but I do believe one thing about angels that, that I can't help but believe is they love God. They love God, that they love Jesus, that, that they love Him. And I can't imagine being an angel and being forced to be idle while they spit in his face 
and while they plucked his beard, and while they punched him and hit him. And didn't Jesus say, I could call right now 12 legions of angels and they would come deliver me. And I can imagine the angels leaning over the banisters of heaven, as it were, waiting for the word and would come and rescue him in grand fashion. And yet he didn't call them. They kept their swords in their sheaths and they weren't allowed to rescue him. So the angels were employed. Also, God employed human circumstances. You know, one day uh, Caesar uh, was thinking and he says, you know what I think I should do? I think I should make everyone register for taxation. We need more organization. And so I'm going to, in the land of Palestine in particular, I'm going to put out a decree and all of the empire, they're going to be taxed. And so everybody would have to go to the city of their origin in order to be registered uh, for the census and the taxation. Now, what made him think that up? What made that thought come into his head? Well, God orchestrated that. Why? Because you see, Jesus' mother was in Nazareth. But she needed to be in Bethlehem. And so God orchestrated it so that Mary and Joseph made the hard, long trip to Bethlehem. No one would make that trip while pregnant unless it was something they had to do. And so this was orchestrated to bring them down to uh, Bethlehem. We think of also the actions of the Sanhedrin. All the things that they did. Uh, They were thinking this up. Uh, But mainly it was God using, listen, God using even the devil and the demons to coordinate with his master plan. You say, well, that's a strange concept. Well, it is a concept that is scripturally supported. Let's understand something. Even the devil is God's devil. And you think about it. The devil put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. But the Bible predicted that Jesus would be betrayed. All of this was just following God's plan. Even Satan does nothing but what is uh, worked into God's plan. So the actions of the Sanhedrin, the hatred they had, was all orchestrated. You had Judas and Pilate and Caiaphas, all of them thinking they were acting on their own. But actually, they were pawns in the hand of a sovereign, omniscient God working things out. I want us to turn to a scripture that shows this in a very powerful way. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. I want you to have a little time to find it. I know sometimes I don't give you much time, and I just read it to you. But I want you to see this in your own scripture in black and white. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which... None of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now what this is saying is that God had a secret plan, and that the rulers of the world, this is Pilate, this is Caiaphas, this is Herod, uh, this is the Sanhedrin, this is Annas the high priest, uh, these individuals, these powers that be, were unaware of the hidden plan of God. And if they had known what God knew, they would not have crucified Jesus. Now, whether or not they would not have crucified him because they would have been humble and submissive to God and would not kill Jesus because they trusted him, or whether they would not have crucified him because Satan wouldn't let them crucify him because he didn't want him dying for the sins of mankind, that's a side issue and a point we may speculate about. But the point made here is they, Jesus would not have been crucified if they had known God's master plan. God kept them in the dark and allowed them to think as they would think in order to bring this about. So the point stands that God kept the time and performed it by employing human circumstances. He also uh, overpowered obstacles. You see, as Jesus was born, uh, Satan began to try to oppose the plan of God. Now, he didn't understand all the elements. He didn't understand everything, but he understood enough. He knew this one that was born was the Son of God. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew why he was coming. And so no sooner was Jesus born than Satan tried to have him killed. And he moved upon Herod to kill Jesus. And in fact, 
uh, Herod was so wicked that he had all the boy babies from two years old and under wiped out in that area so that he could try to kill the Messiah. So Herod had the slaughter of the innocents. God overpowered these obstacles. Also, Satan tried to hinder the plan of God when he tempted Jesus to sin. He said to Jesus, he showed him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, all these will I give you if you will just bow down and worship me. And you can have all these kingdoms. What Satan offered Jesus was a bloodless way to achieve the the, the rule of the world. He gave him an easy way out. But Jesus did not accept that. Also, we see those several times when Jesus was preaching or teaching and the crowd was moved with anger or envy and they tried to kill him. Uh, That was a way to try to stop him on his way to the cross, just to be thrown off a cliff or killed in some other fashion. And okay, one time they even tried to make him a king. You think about Satan tried to alter the timing. Uh, Not only did he try to stop it, but he tried to alter the timing by making him a king. Uh, In John chapter 6, 15, let's turn if you will. John chapter 6 and verse 15. And we see that Jesus was teaching and preaching. And in verse 15 it says, uh, And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again unto a mountain himself alone. So Jesus was not yet to be king. Satan tried to move the crowd, and the crowd tried to move Jesus to become a king when it wasn't the right timing. Listen, listen, there are some things that God wants for you, but not at the time that you think. There are some things that you want, that you prayed for, and God has on his list of things to bless you with, but you're not prepared yet, you're not ready yet, and he knows best, and he is saying to you or to me, wait, and we don't like it when that happens, do we? I don't like to be told to wait. When I want something, I I like to see it coming quickly, not later. But God is wiser than we are. And so the timing uh, was something that Satan tried to alter. Also, Satan tried to rearrange Jesus' schedule. Now, Jesus was going to go to Jerusalem. He had a plan to go to Jerusalem. But his brothers were telling him, go now. Go now. You You who you say you are? Go now. And he said, my time is not yet, but your time is always ready. In other words, he's saying, you can be saved anytime you want, but you you can't tell me what my time is. So he didn't go when his brothers told him to go. But later he went on his own timing. You see, now here's the thing. Jesus is always on time. He's never been late and never will be late. God is always on time. Now you and I can sometimes be late. You and I can sometimes have the wrong timing. We can be too early. We can be too late. Uh, we can do the right thing at the wrong time or the wrong thing at the right time. We can have, uh, be all mixed up. But God never does the wrong thing, and He never does anything on the wrong time. You know, it's been said by many, and it's a good saying, and I agree with it, timing is everything. And that, that could be held true. I mean, you say, well, it isn't everything, but everything has a time. And so timing is so important that it could be said that timing is everything. If Satan can't stop you, he will hinder you or try to make you conform to his timing. Sometimes God says, wait, Satan says, now. Sometimes God says, I have to prepare you first. Satan says, go ahead. Uh, Jacob would only travel at the pace of, of the women and the children in his party. His timing was with them. He didn't race ahead with Esau and his men when he met them. He, he, he went at a pace that was right. I think of the timing. Uh, you think of the judges, the time of the judges. They, they went on cycles. They'd have 40 years or so of oppression. And then God would bring a judge, a hero, a champion. And then they'd, they'd have 40 years of peace. And what did they do with those 40 years of peace? Uh, worship and praise God and thank Him for His blessings. No, they'd fall back into idolatry and then they'd go into 40 more years of of oppression. And that was the pattern. That was the timing. But I think of this fellow Gideon. Gideon was hiding and he was threshing wheat in the, in the, the wine press. Now, you usually thresh wheat up on a hill so the wind can carry the chaff away. 
It's easier that way. You throw it up, the wind carries the chaff away, the grain falls down. He's hiding in the wine press, which is somewhere low, throwing it up and blowing it so nobody will see him. And uh, an angel appears to him as he's cowering there at the wine press, afraid of the enemy. And he says, Hail thou, a mighty man of God. And he looks around. <laughs> he's, you're talking to me? He said, my father's house is the least in Israel, and I'm the least in my father's house. And and the angel said, go in this thy spirit, and you'll win. In other words, if you can be as tough on the enemy as you're talking to me right now, you may have what it takes. And so God began to work with Gideon, and he started out with thousands of soldiers, and God said, there's too many. He said, too many? We're already heavily outnumbered. God says, tell everybody that's afraid to go home. Half of them went home. Think about that. Now, you're the commander of an army that's now already outnumbered, and now you're really outnumbered. And God says, well, it's still too many. And he said, take them down by the water, and the ones that hold on to their spear and lap water while they're looking around, that's your army. There was 300 left. And so he takes his 300, and he goes, and he has a great victory. That, and listen, there was no one that could doubt this was God. This was God. Why? Because God's timing was that you show up with few and God would bless it where a great victory was made. You know, timing is very important. Abraham and Sarah were told they would have a child, but they weren't really told when. Now, when you start getting really old, and back then, a hundred was still old. I know that before the flood, people lived hundreds of years, but this is after the flood. A hundred was old. Ninety is old. And so the angel appeared and and told Abraham that he'd have a child. And Sarah laughed, you know, well, wouldn't you? You're 90 years old. That's pretty comical. But here's the story. Their timing was wrong. They end up having a child the way God did not want them to have a child. And that caused trouble for the family and really for Israel from then on. So timing is very important. Jesus' brothers tried to change God's timing, and and, uh, Abraham and Sarah tried to change God's timing. David had an idea to build the temple. He wanted to build it. God said, no, your son is going to build it, not you. God's timing is always right. You know, when it comes to this thing about timing, a leader must have the right timing. He He must have it right. Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, had drafted the Emancipation Proclamation. He had it as an idea from the beginning. It's something that ought to be done, something he wanted to do, but the timing of it had to be right. He was in the midst of trying to hold the Union together. He was in the midst of trying to win uh, a war. Uh, He was in the midst of trying to achieve solidarity for the entire country. And his great friend, Frederick Douglass, kept urging Lincoln to put out the proclamation and free the slaves. And Lincoln would say, now's not the time. And Frederick Douglass would get angry and frustrated with him and was beginning to even doubt his commitment to the abolitionist cause. Well, there came a time finally when Abraham Lincoln, even though others were saying this isn't the right time, it's too early, but he knew it was the right time. He put out the Emancipation Proclamation and it worked. It was the right time. It wasn't rejected and it accomplished the result. And later... Frederick Douglass, in retrospect, looked back on those events and he said, Lincoln was right and I was wrong. If he had done it when I was urging him to do it, it would not have worked. But he was wise and he did it at the right time when it did work. So he acknowledged that he had the right timing. I think of Winston Churchill, one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen. Uh, Earlier, he had nearly reached the height of political power in Britain for his career by the age of 33 as a cabinet minister and one of the nation's most popular speakers. Yet a series of events and unpopular positions that he took caused Churchill to lose his political standing and become the subject of ridicule and rejection. By the early 1930s, he had been excluded from the seats of power. Churchill's prophetic warnings about Adolf Hitler were ignored by an English public that preferred to hear comforting words of peace. But when Britain was plunged into World War II, Churchill was already 65 years of age. 
Now, this was a time when you were eligible to retire in the English system and draw your pension. But at 65 years old, this man who could have retired was called upon to leave the nation in this most difficult time. And he became the prime minister who inspired the British people to fight and to win that war uh, during their darkest hours. The timing of it uh, was, was uh, very important. He was the man for that time. One of my favorite stories is the story of Sam Houston and the battle for Texas. Santa Ana, as you know, uh, had attacked uh, uh, the Alamo and had killed the people there. And there were people who were really upset about that. And they were wounded in their hearts and they wanted revenge upon Santa Ana for that massacre. Uh, and so uh, Sam Houston had the army and they were going around uh, Texas virtually hiding from Santa Ana and, and uh, maneuvering in such a way as to not engage. Uh, and stories are told that women uh, would curse at him uh, and that even some of his own officers called him a coward. One of them even, it is said, was challenging him to a duel. Uh, and so he had uh, you know, all these critics telling him to engage Santa Ana, but he said, it's not the time. It's not the time. It's not going to work. We'll be beaten if we do it now. Or there came a time when Santa Anna, trying to find uh, Sam Houston, divided his troops, and one group went another way, and, and Santa Anna led another group another way, and now they're divided, and that's when Sam Houston went, and he surrounded Santa Anna with his men and held them hostage, and hardly a shot was fired, and he had a full surrender and got all of Texas without losing his army. Now, those who look back at tactics, those who look back at what happened, credit Sam Houston with excellent timing. His timing worked, but his critics and all of those who urged him to rashly go ahead, uh, their timing would have been absolutely disastrous. So timing is everything. There are certain things that we need to consider when we serve God, is that we don't want to be late. We don't want to get ahead of God either. We don't want to be ahead of Him. We don't want to be behind Him. We want to be right where God says we should be. The last point, and I think this is the most important, of course, is that God gives us time. It is amazing how patient God is. When I think of how God dealt with the nations, the children of Israel went through years and years of slavery, and God revealed it to Jacob, who was named Israel, that his descendants would go into this dark time of slavery. God told him in advance they would be there a long time. And he said they would then come out and take the promised land. And he says, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now I've read that and I've scratched my head and I've thought about it and I've pondered it. And I, I, I think what's, what's going on here is God gave Israel a little bit of insight into God's timing. God knew that the Amorites were going to get more and more and more wicked. And there would come a time when he would have to judge them. But meanwhile, God was giving time for those who would repent to do so. Now, if God knew the entire nation was going to turn their backs on God and were going to continue in idolatry and be so wicked that he would have to judge them, why was it taking so much time unless God is letting it play out as he also knew that some would receive him? And that's the great mystery. That's the thing that we don't comprehend, we don't understand. But I do know this. That's true right now. Why hasn't Jesus already come back? He said he's coming back. Why hasn't he done so? Why hasn't Jesus come back yet? I don't know. But what if the reason he hasn't come back yet is there still some he's going to save before he does? That's the only explanation I have. God's work isn't through because God's work isn't through. It'll be through when it's through. Listen, when the last person who under this dispensation comes to Jesus in faith, then the time will be right, the trump will sound, Jesus will appear, and it won't happen until then. And there's nothing you and I can do about it except wait for it to happen and be faithful where we are. You don't know, but you might be the one to lead the next one to Christ. We don't know, but once some child or some older person or some teenager, we don't know. We do know this, God gives us time, and God is long-suffering. He is putting up with things for a long time. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this, 
The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whenever I come across somebody who tries to tell me that repentance isn't necessary for salvation in the new dispensation, in the New Testament, I bring them to this verse. And I tell them that God is willing that all should come to repentance. He wants you to come to repentance. He doesn't want you to perish. So if I would say, what is God's will for your life? Well, I don't know all the details of God's will for your life, but I know one thing that God has told me himself in his word. One thing I know about God's will for your life is that you not perish. That's one thing I know about your life. It is not God's will for you to perish. So what is God's will? God's will for you to be saved. It's God's will for you to be saved. Because if you're not saved, that's all you can do is perish. It is God's will for you to be saved. That's why he came. That's why he suffered. That's why he died. And he is now patiently waiting on you to comply with his will. And if you do not do so, you will go to hell against the very expressed will of Almighty God. He will not make you believe. He will not force you to believe. He will not compel you, but he will call you and he will woo you in your heart. And it is up to you to respond. God is long suffering. I think about the years and years that Noah preached to the uh, the people of his day and they laughed and mocked and jeered and did not trust God and did not believe and at one time finally the flood came at the timing of God I think of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and the time and the, the the patience that God had with that wicked culture until finally said enough and he caused the fire and brimstone to fall and wipe out those wicked cities I shudder for our country when I think of the things that uh, that we are guilty of in this country the innocent blood and the the, the wickedness and uh, the, the sin and the reveling uh, in all kinds of wickedness. And I think uh, that if God uh, looked at us through the eyes that he had when he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah, how do we stand up? Is there a man, is there a woman that makes up the hedge and stands in the gap away from God's judgment? I, I fear for our culture. But now I want to make this last point. God gives us time, and God is long-suffering, but the time to be saved is always now. Listen, if you were to ask me, when should I get right with God, my answer would be right now. And I'd be right. If you were to say, when should I get saved and, and, and accept Christ, I would say right now. There's no other time. It's always now. It's, it's either now or it's a rejection. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, while it is said today, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Now what the Bible is referring to is a time when Israel turned their hearts hard against God, and they were supposed to turn their hearts softly, willingly, and submissively to God. Today, now, the time of salvation is always now. Let me explain it this way. Now is the later that you talked about last time the Lord spoke to your heart. If you say, I'll accept him later, I'll accept him at another time. Well, that's this time. You, you've already done that before. So now is the time. You say, oh, no, no, I'm gonna make you just keep kicking it down the road. You just keep putting it ahead. Listen, what you're, what you're being is a career Christ rejecter. What you're being is a repeat offender against the grace of God. When the Holy Spirit of God speaks to the heart of an individual, the only acceptable response is yes to the Holy Spirit and no to Satan. Jesus wants you to be saved. He's already expressed that in his word. He is giving us time to be saved. That is something we know from his word. But when should you be saved? The thing is, we don't know God's timing. We don't know the future. As far as we know, we don't have another minute past the one we're in right now. We do not know that. So the only time that we can do something for God right is to do it now. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to your timing. And Lord, that we would be bold, that we would be brave, that we would be diligent, that we would be wise. Lord, help us not to be indigent. Help us not to be cowardly. Help us not to be ignorant. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to be right with you in the time and Lord, to trust you with the time, knowing that you are the master of it and not we ourselves, knowing Lord, that you are all wise and that Lord, if we trust you, uh, we will be wiser for having done so. And Lord, I pray for anyone under the sound of my voice who has not yet made life's most important decision to receive Christ as Savior, that this would be the day of salvation. Uh, As the hearing of it would be, uh, the calling upon you would follow. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.